Thank you, Brother Dylan. Let me again say thank you for all you all have done for us. They must do that for you because you're like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we appreciate. Oh, good. Why are you sitting there, man? Did anybody, did any, have I told y'all how much I love your pastor here? Um, I love Brother Kenny and uh, appreciate him and his sweet wife. And uh, You've got a blessing. You've got a treasure. Let me say thank you again to all the ladies who are here and to those, you brethren who have taken the time to make sure that this meeting's ready to go. And, um, we certainly have felt welcome and, and enjoyed the fellowship that we have with all of you. This morning especially, this morning was um, uh, quite a treat. Got to meet up with Brother Elton at his favorite McDonald's this morning and um, got to see where he sits. And I've heard and heard and heard and heard about it, but I've never been to that particular McDonald's. So <laughs> I know where to find you, you know, and I can find you whenever I know you're at the McDonald's now. So i um, glad for that. But uh, being here and seeing all of you and then these old songs, um, uh, that's generally what's been on my mind um, last night, this morning, and there's some things that I hope to be able to share with you, and you'll be able to enjoy it like I have. Um, we talked la last night a lot about the things that are going on in our country and uh, that are going on in the world and how troubling they can be, but I'll ask you the question I asked the folks at Borger. If it wasn't for the news media and the many restrictions that have been put on us, um, how would we know how bad it really is? Um, I feel pretty fortunate. Maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm uh, not exposed to much of the world through my upbringing and where I have been and the many places I've traveled in, in, in the country. Uh, I recognize that Chicago and Dallas and Phoenix and uh, Los Angeles and all of that are wondrous places to go but I'm glad that I got to go back to my little small town. Um, and Lubbock and Amarillo are really small towns compared to those big cities. And so uh, I feel in many ways to be somewhat naive of what is going on or what's really going on in the big cities. Um, and it, like I said last night, it's hard to find the truth. Also, that being said, uh, I was born at the Amarillo Air Force Base Hospital, my brother and I, and from that location to my current home is about 12 miles. Um, so I've said to people in the past, I've really gone far in life of 12 miles, you know. Um, so, and then being in the churches that are in West Texas, literally all of my life, I can't remember a time whenever I didn't love the Lord. All of that being said, um, sometimes people come in and amongst us and they wonder, how it is that we can be so happy whenever seemingly we have so little and yet we have so much we are so rich we are abundantly blessed in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ his grace and mercy that is on us and we see times in scripture over and over again where the Lord's people have been led into captivity because of their own actions and I've, I'll tell you what I told Brother Gary this morning. I'm a little fearful for the mega churches that are in our country today because today they're not able to meet. They're meeting in the parking lots or drive through parking lot get togethers or whatever. And make no mistake, the Lord's people are everywhere, okay? They're everywhere. They're places we don't even know where they are. Uh, these are our friends, these are our loved ones, these are our family members. And there may be some things that we differ on that are either uh, practice or doctrine or whatever, but they still belong to God. Amen. And I pray for them because they're missing out because their great numbers would cause them to not be able to really have worship at all. And so uh, we're very fortunate. We're very rich. We're abundantly blessed to be able to meet together and to be able to enjoy what we're enjoying today. Which leads me to my text, which is found in the Psalms. Um, in the 137th and 138th Psalm, there's a story here that's told about the children of Israel. And they are in the captivity of the Babylonians. 
Now, there's not much history written about the actual captivity. The place where it was is there. Uh, they, we know that it, during that time, um, it took about 70 years. They were in bondage for about 70 years. We know that. And we actually are able to, I'll say, discern from the scriptures because things that are written to us up to the captivity are written in the books, books of Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Esther. We read about what they were going through and how in many times uh, that the story is told, they seem to be down, uh, discouraged. They seem to be uh, depressed. They seem to be worried about their circumstances and seemingly can't do anything about it. And then we read what happens to them in these Psalms. And I think we can parallel this with our own lives being put into the situation that we're in today. Uh, I think all of us in some way have been affected emotionally or psychologically or physically about uh, this country and how things have changed so dramatically, especially over the last few months. But really the last 15, 20 years has been somewhat interesting uh, and sometimes difficult to understand why. And yet we see the Lord's people who are instructed over and over again, and I'll get to some of that on what they should do, and yet they refuse to do it, and then they wonder, why me? Why is this happening to us? But here in the 137th Psalm, I want you to see something that, to me, is one of those stories that uh, I think it's a great way of reflecting on our beliefs. And you've already made mention of song. You've already talked about that. Uh, we've had a wonderful song service. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. I may pull on your heartstrings a little bit, but I weep today because I remember Zion. I remember, I'm sorry, Sister Margaret. Thanks for, thanks for picking that song. Uh, Uncle Harvey and all the old associations and all the times getting together. I miss that. I miss those that have gone on to be with the Lord and their exuberance, their joy in being together. Um, now, don't get the wrong idea. I'm, I'm elated to be with you today, and I see your joy, and I see your delight in the Lord. And I pray and pray and pray that we can keep that going. Uh, that's why we need young people like you, Brother Dylan, and your family. Um, we, need the, we need the sisters who are uh, there for us, to prepare for us, to support their husbands, to support the church. We need the young children who are here today. Which one of these young children here today, if they continue to live and continue in this church, will be the ones to help take out the trash, to help make coffee on Sunday mornings? Which one will they be? I hope that they will be here, and I hope that the Lord will continue to bless us. Um, and how many of you out there look at men like me and think, my goodness, boy, if the Lord can do it to him, he can do it to anybody. Because you all know what I was like whenever I was uh, uh I'll say it this way, um, and it's kind of funny, but uh, one of the young men that's coming to the church in Borger now, Brother Seth Venable, um, his mother and father told me a story last night about how that boy got all kinds of whoopings whenever he was young, and I, would, I, st I stood there thinking to myself, Seth didn't get near as many whoopings as I did. I don't care what you say. I remember those things. Certainly you all do too. These people were mocked because it says, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For, they, for there they had carried us away captive, requiring of us a song. And they that wasted us requireth of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Go ahead, sing us one of your songs. The question is asked here, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How can we? Whenever we're surrounded by so many that would try to mock God or try to mock what we believe, try to, to uh, 
bring us down from the mountain that we live on. We, we live on a mountain, do we not? We live uh, seeing the, light, the Lord high and lifted up. And yet, oftentimes, we see in our lives that we're down in the valleys, and the valleys may seem kind of low, but I want you to think about something. The mountains are a place of exaltation where we see the grandeur and the glory of the Lord, and you see how wonderful it is. How much vegetation is there up there on top of that mountain? I mean, really good vegetation. There's little or nothing. All that we can do up there is observe and enjoy and, and look at it and see how wonderful it is. In the valleys of our lives, think about it. In the valleys is where the good corn grows. <laughs> and we see the Lord's blessings on us most of the time when we're in the valley. And we see how glorious his work is way up there on the mountain. Oh, we want to get back up there, but we can't stay there for long because we'll run out of that glory. And all of a sudden, it's just a pretty picture. We need to be back in a place where we can feed and feed in the good ground to be able to sing the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? He says, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let thy tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. And if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, he says, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, race it, race it, even to the foundations thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, he's telling them here, they're going to be destroyed. The story is told uh, in the book of Isaiah, how they're going to be destroyed and that, they're, that their children are not going to, to no longer be able to cause us to have suffering, at least not from Babylon. He says, O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Whenever we're no longer subject to the the perils of that type of persecution, that type of bondage. Now, of course, in many ways, he's speaking of a time for us whenever the Lord's going to come and take us home. <laughs> and maybe today is the day. I mean, it'd be okay, Brother Dylan, if we didn't have your ordination, if the Lord came and got us right now, wouldn't it? I mean, that'd be all right. We'll still go through with it if he doesn't, if he doesn't come. We're going to do what we're supposed to do. But if he came right now, would that be all right? Or would you have to, do you feel like you need to give him permission? Uh, he doesn't need my permission. There's nothing in this world that's ever going to be able to compare to the glory that's going to be revealed. Nothing. And I wish people could get that into their heads. Oh, but I've got so many great goals that I want to, a, a, a tr that I really, really am looking forward to accomplishing. And as older people, we're getting to the point where we've got bucket lists, you know. Yeah, I still want to see the seven wonders of the world, but I don't think it's going to happen. But it's okay if the Lord comes, I won't have to worry about it anymore. Because nothing here is going to be as wonderful as that that is to come. Now, he says to us here in the 38th Psalm something else that's very special. He says, I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods, little g, will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Magnified thy word above above all thy name. And as much as we love and care and appreciate one another, do you know that eventually, if we live long enough, we'll forget one another? I mean, there are people that are in my life that are family. And what's Connie's little girl's name? And she's a cousin of mine, I can't remember. I don't know. But in statements like this, we recognize that the Lord himself, the Father, set his son up so that his name would never be forgotten. Do you realize that? We may forget one another, but we will never forget the name Jesus Christ. 
we will never forget Christ the Lord. That's how great an impact he's had on humankind, the world, and especially his people's knowledge of him. We'll never forget the name Jesus Christ. And whenever we know, we know this for a fact, whenever we have our family members and friends who have developed dementia and Alzheimer's and those types of things, they might not be able to speak to you, but all you got to do is start singing the songs of Zion and all of a sudden they can sing all the words. They know the words. Where did that come from? It didn't come from sitting in the pews for 40 years. It came from the Lord writing those into their heart and for them knowing who the Lord is. That's what it is. That's where it comes from. And he says, all the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. He says, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Which brings me to the other part of this story. Afar off. I've spent quite a bit of time studying the book of Samuel in recent months. And uh, the book of Samuel has a lot of interesting stories in it. But again, we're back to the same thing. A similar story is told in Samuel as, Samuel as what I told last night. God's people rise up and are blessed, see those blessings, take those blessings for granted, and then turn their backs on what the Lord has told them to do, and then the Lord suffers it. You know, it, people say, I can't believe that the Lord would allow such things to happen to such good people. <laughs> and... My friend David Montgomery said to me and the church at Borger a couple of years ago, he said, I, I had a conversation with a lady about that, and she was pretty upset whenever she heard my answer. And he said, there are no good people. There are no good people. The Lord suffers it to be so. Do you think whenever we're suffering, the Lord's sitting up there going, <laughs> I told you that, I told you not to do that. No, he's not doing it. He's not at all happy that he has to do that. Were you happy at all whenever you had to punish your children? Were you happy when you punished Ed? No, I wasn't. Since he's not here, you have to tell him I was picking on him. We're not happy about that. The Lord's not happy about that. But yet it, it, we need to be taught a lesson. We have to be taught a lesson. And we have to learn these lessons over and over and over again. And I suspect we'll continue to learn these lessons over and over and over again until the Lord comes to take us home. Amen. We're forgetful creatures. We just don't have the ability to hang on to his words every day, every moment, every minute of every day. I can't do it. Can you? Can you hang on to the words of God for every moment of the day? We get busy on something and all of a sudden it leaves us. And if we don't focus on the things of God, we focus on the things of the world. And I can say without any reservation, whenever I'm focusing on the things of the world, I am not thinking about the things of God. It is very difficult to think on the things of God. Likewise, it is very difficult to think on the things of God and concentrate on the things of God and set aside all the things of the world. I hope that some of you are listening to what I'm saying and putting aside the things of the world. But I know some of you are thinking about, well, we've got dinner in a little bit, and we've got the ordination, and okay, this afternoon it's going to be 100 degrees, and I've got to worry about the house. I mean, we need to be here to focus on the Lord. I hope we can focus on the Lord for just a little while because we're going to turn around and fail him. And in the first chapter of the book of Samuel, the story starts out as Samuel being this young child and being prophesied about and he's going to be a great leader and a great king we see in the first chapter how that the first and second chapters how the prophet Eli was doing so many good things and yet his sons uh, did things that were against what God would have him to do and Eli didn't do much about it and some language in that is some of my favorite language about us serving the Lord it's it's something that we need to hear. It's something that needs to be heard all the time. It's my, one of my favorite verses. It's found in the second chapter of 1 Samuel. The Lord asked him these questions. 28th verse. 
And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me, and did give unto the father, the house of thy father, all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Did I? Yes, he did. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offerings, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chief, chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that, that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. He has still said that, and that still applies to us. We should be walking with the Lord forever. Anyone here thinks that he stopped walking with us? He's still walking with us. And then he says, But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me will I honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So what do you want from God? To be honored by the Lord or to be lightly esteemed? There's where you have a choice. We talked about a little bit about free will last night, but I'm telling you, that's where you have some choice. Uh, free will will only take you so far, and here he's given us example after example of how we should be honoring the Lord and doing the things that he has told us to do, and by doing that, he will honor us. I would love to have the honor of the Lord put on us, put on his church, and she, and she is honored of the Lord over and over again. We have been honored over the years over the centuries now, we've been in, we've been in existence for, for centuries. We can trace the church all the way back to Christ and John the Baptist at, on the River Jordan. We know her history. We know she suffered some, some many tribulations, but she's also enjoyed some many, many glorious, wonderful things. And she will again. But you and I have got some work to do, do we not? I know that there's somebody that mows the yard at the church. I don't know who he is, but I'm glad he's doing it. What happens if he's gone? I know that there's some preacher there who's studying the word. Sometimes we get to hear it. Sometimes, well, have you ever had one of those days, Brother Kenny, where you didn't think that you preached a lick? I've felt that. You felt that before? Are we supposed to just give up? Or do we keep trying? We've got to keep trying. We've got to keep going. That's very important. This is what we're seeing in the scriptures. These are some of the landmarks that we enjoy in the church. Hearing and seeing these things. Hearing them over and over again. And in the uh, seventh chapter of this book, the story that's being told here is whenever Israel was blessed to defeat the Philistines. You recall the Philistines beat them took the ark. They took the ark of the Lord. Well, that didn't work out too well for the Philistines. First off, they weren't supposed to have it. And they weren't able to keep it very long. And all manner of bad things happened to them whenever they did keep it. That should be a lesson to us. If we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, there's some things that are going to happen that aren't going to be all that good. And we see in the seventh chapter, and we start about the uh, eighth verse, it says, and the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. <laughs> so they're asking the minister to pray for them. I get that. Do you, do you brethren get that? People call you up and say, pray for us. And make no mistake, child of God, we are happy to stop right there and pray. And pray and pray if the effectual fervent prayer as best we can that the Lord would bless you in whatever needs you have. But we are no closer to God than you are and you could, and your prayers can go up from where you are at. If you want others to pray for you, that's great because many prayers, I mean, we're, there's times whenever we're called on and the, the churches are called on to pray, the elders are called in to pray and we ought to pray. What should we be praying for today in 2020? Got a lot of good questions on that. Well, should we be praying that the 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 virus, COVID nineteen, just go away? Well, we can pray that. Can we? What about our economy? Do we need to pray about that? What about our enemies that are 
foreign and domestic. What about, what do we need to pray for? Well, I think the best thing for us to pray for is what the Lord has said, is that we ought to pray, Father, Lord, thy will be done. And then you and I continue to do what the Lord would have us to do. Now, one of my, the landmarks in my life, and I hope it's the landmark in your life, is the church, his bride, a place where we get to come together, a few of his saints, to worship and to sing his songs, sing those songs of Zion. And, though, and we, we're not hanging our harps in the willows here. We're singing. When we get together and we sing, do you sing from the heart? Or do you sing from the book? Or do you sing just to sing along? If you're not singing to the Lord, you're not singing the way you ought to be singing. And who cares if you're on key? Who cares if you miss, the, miss a word or two? If you're singing to the Lord, he hears it, it's perfect, it's on key, and he loves every note that comes out of your mouth if you're singing unto the Lord. This is one of the great landmarks of this church. And we read how that Samuel offered a burnt offering. He took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered, <laughs> thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And all the men of Israel went out of Mizpeh and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone. And set it between Mezpeh and Shin, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. That's where the songwriter gets that, that word, that here I raise my Ebenezer. What is your Ebenezer? We all have one. My Ebenezer is that the Lord has provided for us a place of worship whenever we can go when we want to go, however we want to go, and we don't have to be, worry about being hindered by anyone. We can go as the Lord sees fit. We can go as we are called. We should be able to go. That's what, uh, that's what the brethren that wrote about this were concerned about doing. In many places, we see how Paul and Timothy and others were imprisoned and, and beaten with many stripes because... There were those that were out there who would have them not preach these things, not sing these songs. I got news for you. The scriptures say there is nothing new under the sun. There are people still out there in the world today, the world's a big place, who do not want you to sing these songs. Who do not want you to worship the Lord God Almighty. Who do not want you to be a part of fellowship and worship. There are people out there. We have seen it. What are we going to do? I'm going to raise my Ebenezer. And my Ebenezer is, is that the Lord has called us to preach and to teach and to do the things that he would have us to do. Why? Because I don't like the consequences of, that I see in scripture of not doing what the Lord has told us to do. The examples are given. Whenever I was a younger man in my ministry, I used to think that this book was about 50-50 on salvation and that type of thing, and then the instruction and far, as far as the guide in life. And the more I studied it, the more I read it, the more I thought, well, it's probably about 70-30 on the guide of life. And now I'm convinced it's about 95-5. It's a guide about how to live our lives and the examples given of what happened to those who didn't follow what the Lord had told them to do. I think most of the Bible is talking about doing that. And all through it is riddled story after story that are examples of how God himself sent his son, his name is Jesus, and he has saved his people from their sins. And you can find it all through the scriptures. Here we see that Samuel has taken a stone and called it Ebenezer, and, the, and that Ebenezer was that the Lord has helped us. The Lord has helped us, has helped the church 
all down through time. And I don't think there's anybody here that would argue with me. I believe he's going to continue to help us until he sends his son to come and get us. He's not going to stop helping us, Brother Don. He's always going to be there for us whenever we need him. But there's still work to do. How many times do we see in Scripture where the children of Israel went into battle and the Scripture says that the Lord gave them the victory? But did he fight the battle for them? Or did they have to fight it? There's work for us to do. People say, oh, the old Baptists, they don't believe in works at all. <laughs> and I would say, you know, you're just as exactly backwards on that as you possibly can be. I believe in good works. I believe in doing all of these good works. And I think that we ought to do good works all the days of our lives. And I think it's important for us to realize that these works need to be done. But we're not doing good works in order to squeeze some blessing out of the Lord. We're not doing good works so that we might have a hope someday. And maybe one day, maybe something, maybe good will happen to us. I'm doing all of these good works because the Lord has done all these things already for us. Always doing good things for us. Always putting us on the path that we need to be on. Always doing these things for us. And I, I've encouraged the church at Borger, maybe we'll preach about it tomorrow, to read the 8th, 9th, 10th chapters because even in the 10th and 11th chapter of this book, uh, Samuel's sons didn't do what they were supposed to do. They said, give us a king, give us a king. And the Lord said to him, they haven't done this to you, Samuel. They've done it to me. So listen to them. Give them what they want. And they got Saul. And it didn't work out too good for them. It didn't work out. I want to take you to one other place. I want to take you back to the book of Joshua. And I, I want to show you another. This is, in my opinion, another Ebenezer that was given. But in the book of Joshua, there's a, a nice story that happened there. You know that uh, the children of Israel crossed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were divided for them again. And, and they crossed over Jordan with Joshua as their leader. And as it, as it happens in the fourth chapter, it says, And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command you them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, Twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in a lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. And then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared for the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark, the ark of the Lord, into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man, you a stone, upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign. Among you, that when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them and say that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Forever. Another Ebenezer. Another way. Now, you all have your memories of the church. Mine are special. I remember going to church meetings, and uh, I remember being old enough that uh, Grandma had to wet handkerchiefs, and we drove home in a car that didn't have air conditioning, and but the windows were rolled up and had to be rolled up, and the dust was blowing so hard that Grandpa could barely see to drive, and she put wet rags on our face, so that we wouldn't have to breathe all that dirt. That's West Texas. And I remember us meeting in tents, and it was 100 degrees outside. And the preachers were blessed to preach. And it was good, and we enjoyed it. We loved it. We loved it. Funny, I don't remember it being hot, but I know it was. Because every sister in the place had a handkerchief or something. I mean, it was just that way. And we ate good, and the singing was out of this world. This morning in this place, the singing was out of this world. This morning, the spirit in this place has been wonderful. The fellowship and greeting one another has been absolutely joyous. These are, in many ways, those same stones. 
These are, in many ways, those things that our children should remember. It's wonderful to me to run into people that haven't been in the church. I wish they were. They left the church or they're off with someone else or maybe they moved away. And they ask questions about the old Baptist church. Are y'all still having dinner after services? Well, yeah. Are you kidding? Is, is sister so-and-so still alive? No, she passed away. Oh, I love the little things she used to bring, all that stuff. Let's pick on, oh, I love him so much. Let's pick on Brother John Barrett. I'm telling you, Brother John, I said it two weeks ago. Two weeks ago I told the story. It's still a story that has to be told. It's another stone. It's another memory. I was young in the ministry. I was just starting to preach and just started pastoring that church. And, of course, we had lunch after church. And, we, and I went up to the table to get a little dessert. Brother James, did you try my coconut cream pie? Brother James, did you try my red velvet cake? Brother James, did you try my peach cobbler? Brother James, before I went back to the table, I had one of them big plates full of dessert. And here's this young man back there saying to me, that's a lot of sugar, preacher. <laughs> and I just about had a diabetic episode before I got to the house. And today at Borger, that's why we have those little bitty plates. <laughs> These are stones. These are memories. These are wonderful memories. The preaching is the best part of it. Hearing about the glory of our Lord. Hearing about what he's done for us. Hearing about all the things that he has promised to do for us and he will do for us. And the greatest promise is he's coming back. One of these days, he's coming to get us. I can't wait till the father finally says to him, Son, go get my children. And he's going to go get every one of them. Every one of his children. Not one will be spared and not one will be lost. He's coming back. Those things have to continue to be taught. The resurrection is vital to what we believe. I believe that we're going to be brought back to life if we go into the grave. I believe that my Savior was put into that grave and stayed in that grave three days and three nights. I believe it. I don't have one bit of forensic proof, but I believe it, that it happened. I believe that after he was resurrected, many of the saints came out of the grave. I believe from the teachings of the scripture and from the evidence I see in the scripture and the many stories that I can find of in secular history, those that came out of the grave were those 144,000 that are talked about. And I believe that there are two other, men, two other men that were translated out of this lifetime and were put into heaven in an immortal glory. And I believe right now there are 144,002 that are in heaven, body, soul, and spirit. Christ is body, soul, and spirit, but he's the word, the living word. I believe it. I have no forensic evidence whatsoever, but I believe it based on his word. This is part of that Ebenezer. This is part of those 12 stones. This is what we need to be teaching our children this is how our children need to be brought up to understand and to know that he is God and beside him there is none other. And no other man is going to be able to get us to heaven. It's only through Christ, only by his work, and only by what he, the Father, and the Holy Spirit did. Many of those things before the foundation of this world, before anything was ever, ever created. There was no matter, for those of you who are scientific in nature and mind, Matter, antimatter, gravity, laws of nature, all of that. None of it existed. Nothing. And he put it into place. If he's got the power to put it all together and put it all in place, well, then he certainly has the ability to make sure that we're able to do those things. And I think we can. I think we can see them. I think we have the ability to see them. I think he's given us the ability to see them. It's so important for us to continue in this way. It's so important whenever our children ask, what does it mean that we have the right answers, the right answers, the good answers? And the answers are the answers that come from God. 
There are answers that need to be told. There are stories that need to be told. Now, let's go to the New Testament for a little while. And I trust the Lord will bless us for a little while in that. I want to take you to the book of Romans. Uh, it is a favorite book of mine, but it's something that uh, in all of this I want people to see. We've spent a lot of time on grace. We've spent a lot of time on what God has done for us and is doing for us. Now I want to talk about not just his grace, but the honor that you and I should give him. And we all come short. So don't get the idea that we're going to be able to come up to some point and all of a sudden uh, we're going to reach that pinnacle of righteousness and all of that. We can only do that if Christ gives us the ability to do it. We can only do that if God has made that for us. Remember, he has made us accepted in the beloved. Okay? So there's a work that is outside of our scope of abilities. He has made us accepted in the beloved. Now, you and I have a responsibility, like, like Paul said, to present our bodies a living sacrifice which, and, and we're supposed to do that holy and, ex, holy and without blame. And that is what? Our reasonable service. I liken that phrase as, do you have friends and neighbors who are willing to do something for you? There's a guy that I work with, and he's always doing nice things for me. And I always try to repay him. And one time he finally said to me, he goes, can't somebody do something nice for you without you having to feel like you got to pay them back? Well, that put it into perspective for me. The Lord has done so many wonderful things for us, and yet he does not demand. It's our obligation, it's our duty, it's our responsibility, and we ought to, because of all the good things he's done for us, follow him in a manner in which he has given us. I mean, there is an order to it, right? He has provided us great order and great discipline in what we should do. And he is the king, right? So we ought to give him homage and praise and honor and all the things that go with it in the way that he would find it acceptable. He's given us a guideline for it. We find it in the fifth chapter of that book of Romans. It's one of the most beautiful things about it. And I wish people in the world could get it into their heads that you do not have the right. You do not have the right. Let me say it one more time. This is not Laodicea. You know what Laodicea means? The rights of the people. You look in the book of Revelation and you find the, the rights of the Laodiceans. They thought they had the rights. The Lord had some things against them. We do not have the right to demand things from God. We don't. We can't command him to do something. This is not God. Okay, God. Okay, God. You sit right there. And when I need you, I'll come and get you. And there are people out there in the world who think they can do that. There are, unfortunately, ministers who can teach that or do teach that. What a falseness. What a falsehood to teach something like that. You sit right there until I need you. And whenever I really need you, I'll come and ask you for your help. That's not the way it works. It says in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Being justified by faith. What does that mean? Being justified by faith. I think he's talking about Christ. I think that faith that's talked about here is Christ and what Christ has done for us. He tells us about it being an atonement. He tells us about something that Christ has done. But he makes it very clear that he says we have peace with God. I would really like to have peace with God. Having God as a, as a symbol like this, I'm not at peace with that. I can't, I can't buy into that. I just can't think of something that is an idol or something else. I'm not at peace with that. My God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So why am I supposed to uh, think that I can command him to do anything? Look at how he says this. He says, by whom we also 
have access by faith into this grace. The best way for me to put it to you, and I don't know if I've told you, but it bears repeating. Some of you have heard it. Some of you haven't. Which one of us think that we have the right to just walk in to the mayor's office of Lubbock, Texas? I mean, just walk in. I bet you we can't walk into Don Richards' office. I bet he's got a secretary out front, and who knows? He might have an armed guard out there. Which one of us think that we can just walk right into the governor's office, into the governor's mansion? I mean, Greg, I got to talk to you about some things. I mean, just walk right in. You have to make an appointment, I'm sure. Which one of us thinks that we can walk into President Trump's office? <laughs> just walk right in. We used to could 100 years ago. We could walk up, knock on the door, and they'd let you in. And you might get to talk to the president 100 years ago, but today he's behind an iron a fence and all that other stuff and people on the roof and everything else. You're not getting in that place unless you've been invited to come in and you are escorted in. And yet... In the religious world, people think that they have the ability to demand things from God. Paul says right here, we have been granted access into this grace. Granted. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. I got a lot of friends out there in the world who cannot understand that verse. Do you understand it? I understand it. We glory in tribulations. We've got, I would be willing to say, and God bless her heart, uh, Sister Venable, she's fallen down. She won't want, she doesn't want to go to the doctor, and we pray that she'll come out of it. And if she does, a few days from now, she'll say, yeah, the Lord took care of me in that. We glory in tribulations. And not, and he says, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Given. We didn't ask for it. It's given unto us. Imputed unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now, much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Saved eternally, forever, and saved in this lifetime if, there is an if, in this lifetime we will be saved if we follow the commandments of God. I got news for people. The Ten Commandments are still in effect today. I don't care what monument or what building you take them off of, they're still in effect today. And God's word does not change. They're still in effect. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who, by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement. We have such a great friend that without him, without the Lord, without his grace, I heard a lady say it one, one time. We were talking about salvation. We were talking about the Lord. We were talking about all the things God's done for us. And she wasn't old Baptist, but she said, you know what? If it wasn't for the grace of God, I tell you what, I think all of us would be going to hell. <laughs> and I said, amen, you're exactly right. If it wasn't for the grace of God, we would all be going. And then it dawned on her what she had said. She said it without thinking about what she said, and then it dawned on her what she said. I said, it is by grace. It is by grace. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the atonement. We have such a great friend that if it wasn't for that gift, if it wasn't for him saying to the Father, Father, I love him. I'll do it. I'll pay the price. And on top of that, he was the only one who could pay the price. And he did it. 
It's finished. Let's not try to unfinish the finished work of Christ. It's finished. I love these things. Time's gone. I need to quit. But I hope you know that as the Lord continues to bless his people in this world and continues to bless us despite, <laughs> despite our sinfulness, our unwillingness to, to, to be faithful, we do have that in our nature. It's part of us. It's an it's a inner fight that we all have to fight. He has promised us that one of these days he's going to come and take us home. I hope you look for him every single day. Every day. Look for him every day. Because he's coming. He's coming. Be encouraged. Encourage one another. He's coming. And until then, we're supposed to occupy and take care of his house. Take care of these things. Raise your Ebenezer. Here's where it is. It's in the church. It's amongst his people. May these things be a blessing to you in the days to come.